Okay, so uh, what we want to do uh, today is just to go, go back over a couple of things for our um, organic. I think I said early on, and it will happen again, and I'll, I'll probably re be repeating myself a lot, um, is that you'll find that the more functional groups that we do in organic, um, hopefully the more you're forming these, these connections between the functional groups. Um, the last thing we talked about um, in the previous session, I think we talked about alcohols. And because we spoke about um, alcohols, that is primary alcohols and secondary and tertiary alcohols, but because we touched on a primary alcohol, we automatically, when we spoke about oxidation of a primary alcohol with dichromate, we automatically said that we are going to produce an aldehyde in that process. Okay, so that's what we're going to touch on today. So we'll look at aldehydes um, and in this instance also ketones. Aldehydes are more important though than ketones. Um, if we spoke about a secondary alcohol, which we did, another functional group here, and if we oxidise a secondary alcohol uh, with dichromate, we obviously end up with, with a ketone functional group. And so the first step in the section of aldehydes and ketones is how do we make an aldehyde? Well, how do we do it? Oxidation of a primary alcohol. All right, there's step number one. All right. But you will remember, hopefully, that that can go further and that will produce for us um, a, try that again, that will produce for us a carboxylic acid. Does anybody recall how do we stop this at the aldehyde stage? Because that was very critical. I had a nice diagram on the board and I said, if you don't do this, you'll end up with a carboxylic acid as the product. Amazing, any ideas? Is it Yes, all right. So in order to stop at this particular stage here, I need to collect the alcohol as it's formed. Okay, so there's a cycle that we go through, okay, and we'll come back to this in a minute because we'll do carboxylic acids as well. So if I'm going to produce an aldehyde, hopefully you can recall that with our, um, with our pear-shaped flask, all right, horrible diagram, there it is, um, and we had our steel head and our condenser down here, um, we said that we need to have our oxidising agent um, separate and we have to actually distill the, the aldehyde off as it is formed. So, very rough setup here. And I forgot what I said before, but this simply is a mixture of acid that we set up there. And believe it or not, um, up here we have a mixture of the dichromate, okay? And say so we're going to start off with ethanol to produce ethanol. We actually have a mixture of the alcohol and the dichromate sitting up there. But of course nothing reacts, or nothing happens until we add the dichromate and the ethanol to the acid. But then the process starts. When we did the section on physical properties of organic molecules, okay, hopefully you can recall that from an aldehyde functional group, which was this one. And then we talked about the secondary binding with an aldehyde functional group. And then we talked about the secondary binding with a than a carboxylic acid. Even if we did have some carboxylic acid produced at this phase, what's the likely scenario? In other words, where is, when's it going to boil? Is it going to boil before the aldehyde or after the aldehyde? It's going to boil after. And why is it going to actually have a higher boiling point than the aldehyde, David? Structure. More, need more. The bonding. So what sort of Secondary bonding is the carboxylic acid going to undergo? H bonding. H bonding. The aldehyde can't have H bonding between itself. It can have H bonding with water, okay, but it's got no OH structure there, so the aldehyde won't secondary bond H bond with itself. We'll have dipole, dipole, but no H bonding. H bonding is top of the list, okay, in terms of strength of H, or strength of secondary bonds. But this one here has obviously got a higher bonding point. So what we say is we distill the aldehyde off 
as soon as it's formed. We have to. If we don't, we end up with lots of carboxylic acid, which we don't necessarily want, okay, um, in our system. So, and of course we have our test tubes or whatever affecting them as, and you collect fractions, is it called fractions, at various boiling points. Now the only thing with this is it's a little bit hit and miss. Um, it's a bit of an estimation. Anybody tell me why it's a bit of an estimation? Dave? What were you talking? You were talking with your finger in your mouth. I couldn't understand you. Alright? So why is this? I mean we just we put that brass together, um, we add the dichrome, mate, we heat it and we get a product and we think the product's the aldehyde. So where's the question mark in this? Mason. Yeah, we don't know where the carboxylic acid starts to form. Okay, that's one option. All right, which is also correct. All right. There is another. There's another issue as well. Um, if we're doing a normal distillation, if I took that away, what would normally sit in the top of our still head? A thermometer, because we're distilling things based on their temperature. We're separating them based on temperature. So we would be able to look up the boiling point of the ethanol. And we then, we, then we could actually then distill the ethanol off, all right, and be precise, or I should say. Is it precise or is it accurate? Accurate. We could be accurate about the actual fraction that we're collecting is definitely the, the aldehyde. So therefore, this is a little, bit, a little bit of an issue with this. We don't really know what the temperature is or the chemical that we're collecting. So we're going to move the test tubes across, okay, to make sure that we don't get too much mixture in our product. But we're hoping the first chemical is most likely going to be the aldehyde having the lower boiling point. Mason? Why well, wouldn't we have the thermometer there? Wouldn't you like to add then, like, and then put the thermometer on top? No, you can't get a thermometer. The thermometer has to be sitting there, and in this apparatus you can't. Not with our system anyway. Jack? If I, if I were to keep heating this, okay, Provided there was aldehyde in here, the aldehyde has to stay in the flask. If there was any aldehyde there, it just keeps on reacting and it goes through to the carboxylic acid. Alright? Now we can do that, we talked about that, but you might have missed that one. So if I wanted to go from a primary alcohol to a carboxylic acid, I need to actually, first of all, do what's called a reflux, okay, and then I distill. I just still off the carboxylic acid. Now, a reflux we said is where we've got condenser vertical, pear shaped flask. Okay, we're heating the mixture. So we do this first in a reflux scenario. If we want to get to a carboxylic acid, so everything's in here. My alcohol is in here, my acid's in here, and my dichromate's all in there. We just whack it all in together. Alright? Can we cook it up? All right, cook things up. All right, so that goes up the condenser. All right, and of course, if it's the aldehyde that's gonna be produced first, it's gonna have low boiling point, that's no big deal. This means it'll be higher at the condenser before it condenses, because it's more volatile. It'll condense, come back down. So the aldehyde cannot escape in this system. Nothing can escape in this system apart from heat. So we make the aldehyde go back down again, and we say, no, you're not going to escape until we turn you into a carboxylic acid. So that process of reflux we'll use when we produce our ester. All right, part of that's to do with the yield of the ester. Here it's nothing to do with yield. It's simply that if we don't keep the aldehyde in the same flask with the dichromate, it's obviously going to disappear. Its boiling point is low. Mason. So if there was no condenser, no carboxylic yep. acid would Correct. So over here, I'd expect to get minimal carboxylic acid, if any. Because as soon as it's produced, the aldehyde low boiling point is gone. So I'm removing, and we hope that that's the system, so that all the aldehyde okay, in the system has immediately been removed from the system. I'm distilling it as soon as it's produced. It doesn't get a chance to stay in the reaction mixture long enough. Whereas here, I'm holding everything together for a long period of time. Okay. Any questions with that one? So, as Mason said, all right, yes, all right. What was your answer again? It was that the... 
It could start forming, yes, all right? But we don't really know whether that's the case because we haven't got a thermometer in there. What would we do? Okay, this is a little bit sidetracked, but if I produce something which I think is the aldehyde, and would be, which that would be the first sample, what would you normally do given some time in our lab? What would you do? It's tomato. Tons test. Yes, you could do a tons test. That would be an, a, a, an actual something that you could do, which I haven't talked about yes. uh, yet. So yes, if I had a question mark about that being the aldehyde, okay, I would go and do my um, tons test. You wouldn't do it on this scale, of course, okay, but it looks good. Um, so you do your tons test, all right, which we will do, by the way, um, next week. We'll do a sample tons test just using glucose. So tons test, with that would be positive, all right, silver mirror we call it. Um, but I was thinking something else. So if you're talking about an organic uh, molecule and you want to purify an organic molecule, how do you do it? Distillation. All right? So you have to distill it. So what you would then do is you'd take what you think is the aldehyde, you would get rid of this, okay? We don't need to have a separating plant at the top. You put the thermometer in, we'll look up the boiling point for the ethanol, and you know we take it from a range, so if the ethanol boiling point is 45, you might start on, like, say, 43, you collect the sample, and you go up to 48. So then we can be definite about the aldehyde, and then we would do the silver mirror, just to confirm that, and we'd get a beautiful silver mirror, because there's no contamination in this instance. But we don't do that. All, right? All we ever do is just one, that's it, collect the aldehyde, and we stop, okay? And we do it at our level, all right? We had unlimited time. Obviously, we could redistill everything and purify everything. All right, let's move on. Preparation of aldehydes. That's how we do it. Okay. The next thing is, as with all functional groups, there is a section that says test for. Okay. Test for. We spoke last lesson about how do we test for primary alcohols and secondary alcohols and tertiary alcohols. We could use a colour change, orange. To dichromate, which is green. That, that unfortunately is going to be a test for a primary alcohol and a secondary alcohol. And of course, if it's a tertiary, we said there's no change in colour, it goes from orange to orange. So we could use a distance between a primary or secondary and a tertiary, but that's about all we can use the dichromate for. How do we test for an aldehyde? Well, Stomati sort of started talking about that a minute ago. And that is called silver mirror, all right? And we've just started that one. So the silver mirror um, is called, it's actually called the Tollens test as well. Um, and this is um, what we use to test for the presence of an aldehyde. So if we suspect that in a container um, we have an aldehyde, then we add tollens. Now it's called a monocle silver nitrate. So there's actually three chemicals uh, that we mix together to make um, the, the reagent for the test. So what we do is we add to this a couple of things. We add sodium hydroxide and we add silver nitrate. Um, and we add aqueous ammonia. We add those chemicals in various proportions, okay? And we end up with a couple of things. I'm just going to refer to the textbook a little bit um, because this aldehyde will end up going to a carboxylate salt. That's one of the outcomes of that reaction, all right? And I've seen that one come up before. But this one here is the most important one. The silver uh, forms a complex iron. So this complex iron turns into silver and that plates on the inside of the flask. Now the one that I've sort of used many a time uh, is this one, this one here and you can bring in a bottle to do your silver mirror test on um, and I have to include a disclaimer there because you're not really supposed to take these homes, take these home because the residue that's left over 
um, in oh, yeah. here can be explosive. I think I've said that before. So when you do, or if you are allowed to take them home, all right, you've got to rinse the flask out afterwards to make sure there's no residue of ammonia in there. You'll know because it's fairly, fairly potent um, odour. So it's got to be completely um, dry, and typically you'll be leaving it here for 24 hours for it to dry out with the lid off anyway, all right, before you take it home. Then you can stop it and it's fine. All right, it's pretty safe. Um, so it works best, you need to have an absolutely spotless container. All right, and I think I've told students in the past that if, you, if you've got a dishwasher or sodium hydroxide, um, put the sodium hydroxide into the bottle or put a dishwasher, make sure it's thoroughly clean. If there's any residue, the silver won't stick, all right? So when I do it as a test, for example, I'll normally use a brand new test tube, all right? Or I'll take a flask like this, rinse it out with some dishwashing detergent, as in sodium hydroxide, not the other stuff, because it leaves a scum on the inside. Sodium hydroxide, take everything off the surface, let it dry, rinse it again, let it dry, and it's ready to go for a silver mirror, should get a good result. All right, uh, the overall reaction I will also give you, it's not a requirement of the course, okay, but we'll give you the overall reaction for this, and it looks something like this one. So, I'm gonna assume um, that we're gonna talk about this one here, F and L. This will be a balanced equation. NH3 plus the three OH minus. And that's going to yield for us the acetate in this instance. Plus the silver. Here's where the odor ammonia comes in right at the end, so it smells fairly potent. Um, all of those, and then we've got plus two HTO. This is really what you need to know, okay, for the exam. Uh, that's the full equation, all right. Um, if you want to, I think in some of the tutorial questions, I ask you um, for the full equation. All right, now, in terms of, um, the next sort of thing that you were asked to look at. Let's have a look at, um, if we could have a look at question 4.17, right, just to apply this straight away, in your book. So can you go to 4.17, page 260? It's right down the bottom, okay? And we can go through all these fairly quickly. So in this instance here, um, what we wanna do is to look at some questions that ask us to distinguish between compound A and B and C and, and D and whatever. So we're now building up a bit of a um, uh, pool, a bit of a resource, if you like, for how we test for certain organic molecules. So we already know that if we have got a primary alcohol and if we add uh, diachromate, we know it's going to turn into an aldehyde, and it doesn't really matter, we can stop it there, but the colour change is going to be uh, orange to green, we already know that. Right. We also know that if we react an aldehyde uh, with diachromate, then that's going to also go from orange to green. All right. So that's another possible test for an aldehyde, depending on what we're asked to look at. So that's a primary alcohol. Secondary alcohol we know is going to be the same. In other words, our secondary alcohol will still go to um, a ketone, but it's still a colour change, so orange to green. It's a test for a secondary. Tertiary we know Okay, so our tertiary alcohol, we know is not going to do anything. All right, when we react it with uh, dichromate, so that's going to be orange to orange. So we'll work that one out. Change the colour, it's getting a bit light. And we also now, now know about aldehydes. We've just worked out a test for aldehydes and silver mirror. So, if I have an aldehyde sitting by itself, 
I can do the tolerance test and we know that we're going to end up with silver. All right, so we can do a tolerance test for an aldehyde. This has also got ketones in this area, okay, in this section of the book. But of course, if I put up ketones, have we done any reactions of ketones or any tests for ketones? No. No, okay. So there's no specific chemical test yet for ketones. Okay. But I will also put up, while we're here, so for that minute, carboxylic acids. There is a test for carboxylic acids that we'll do shortly. And that is, if I react the carboxylic acid either with a carbonate or a hydrogen carbonate, what's the outcome of an acid plus a carbonate? Salt plus water plus CO2. So we end up with carbon dioxide is the main thing here, all right? And so when we're testing for a carboxylic acid, if we think we've got a carboxylic acid present, okay, we are talking about effervescent, is that say so it's okay? So it's going to be some bubbles we would expect to observe. No colour change, but we might get some bubbles if we're going to add some hydrogen carbonate um, or just carbonate, any soluble salt of that version to a sample of the carboxylic acid. We should get some bubbles formed straight away. Whereas we won't get that in anything else. All right, now the, the question, if we look at compound A, we'll just, we'll just go straight down to 4.17. Uh, compound A, and I'll just change, change colour for another reason, just a variety, okay. Here, this is how we actually tackle um, this sort of a question. I'll try and get rid of just all of the hydrogens. So that's compound A there, there it is. Okay, then I've got compound B. Compound B is simply this one. Then I've got compound C. One, two, three, C, H. So I've got three chemicals, and the question said describe chemical tests that would distinguish between the following formula. Include in your description the procedures used and the expected observations. Write annotated equations. Right? This is as far as what you need to go for in terms of an annotated equation. It doesn't say to write dance equations, just what you would see in terms of the observation why the reagents used. Alright, so whenever we're tackling something like this, in terms of how you would do it, well, if I had um, you know, three, three samples of unknowns, uh, one, two and three, and just labelled A, B and C, they're going to be obviously colourless. So you're not going to use all the compound A and perform the whole test in compound A. What you're going to do is you're going to take a small portion of compound A out and you're going to do a test on that. Small portion of B, small portion of C. So it won't contaminate the original uh, solution. I think it's fairly obvious. So that was A, that was B, and that was C in the question. So where do we tackle this? How do we tackle it? For all organic questions, what do we do? Good, we have to identify the chemical or what Will's trying to say is the functional group. All right? So as soon as you know the functional group, you now know about primary alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, we're gonna talk about carboxylic acids, you'll eventually learn on esters, amines, amides. They all do something a little bit different. So learn to pick them out. So this one here is a, a ketone. We're gonna ask ourselves, is there any test we did for ketone? Any chemical tests? No. no. So that's a no-brainer. That's, that's can't do anything with the ketone. That can just sit there for the time being. All right, this one here is? Aldehyde. Okay, this one here? Aldehyde. That's looking good. Okay. So we now know a test for an aldehyde. We just did it. Silver mirror. So I could take a sample of B, put it into a test tube, add tons reagent that I'd make up. Okay, shake it and I should get a silver mirror, positive test for an aldehyde. So I can easily identify between those three, chemically, the aldehyde, that's straightforward. This one, what sort of alcohol? Secondary. Primary, secondary, tertiary. It's a primary alcohol, it's got H2 there. So this is a primary alcohol. All right, so can we distinguish using dichromate?
Yep, so what would I actually do, all right, with all of them? What tests would I have to carry out on all of them first? I could do a dichromate test on all of them. So whatever test I do, I need to do on all three. And then I work it out by process of elimination. So if I did, if I added dichromate here, what would I see? Orange to orange. orange. There's no reaction. That would stay orange. So I could sort of move the ketone off to one side and say that's probably the ketone. If I added dichromate to this one, what would I see? Orange to green. And I add dichromate to this one, I'm going to see orange to green. So the last two, I get the same result. All right. So then what I need to do is another test. So then I carry over and I need to distinguish between, if you do it in this order, you don't have to do it in this order, but one of you said, let's do dichromate, let's do dichromate. So if I did the dichromate test, I have to do it on all of them, this and this are going to give orange to green. So then I need to, with both of them, I need to do Tom's test with this one and Tom's test with that one. Tom's test with this one should give me a silver mirror, Tom's test with the primary alcohol, no reaction, no silver mirror. So it's a process of elimination. So if I were to look at this, I've got compound A, B and C, okay, and we do the following tests. So if I'm going to add dichromate to this one, I'd expect orange to orange. This one here, orange to green. This one here, orange to green. So I can identify that one, I'll tick that one. A I can put to side. That's probably the ketone. It doesn't react at all. I don't have to do anything else with that one. Problem is I'm left with these two. Then I do Tom's test. Do I need to go back into the tolerance with the first one? No. Would I need to? No. Don't think so. Okay, because it's obviously an aldehyde. All right, because it didn't react with dichromate. So there's no distinguishing. There's no issue with that. If it was, if I had all three, that'd be a little bit confusing. All right, all three. That tells me that it could be a primary alcohol, a secondary alcohol, and an aldehyde. Hope we don't get one like that. All right. Then we do tolerance. This one here would give me a positive test, so I've worked out that B is the aldehyde, and of course when I do the same test with a small amount of C, from alcohol, the trans test, no silver mirror. So that process is what we would look at in order to find out which is A, B or C. It's a favourite question in all sorts of exams. Alright, any questions on that one? Nope. Everybody cool with that? All right, we're going to jump into carboxylic acids because we've sort of done them already. Okay, we've sort of started on those already. A couple of things that I'm going to touch on for carboxylic acids. On the board a minute ago, we talked about how to make a carboxylic acid. Primary alcohol, reflux it, distill in the presence of dichromate and an acid. Why do we need the acid? Why do we need the acid? Because what? Catalyst. It's a catalyst in the reaction, exactly. If we do a redox reaction, which is all it is, okay, every time we balance the dichromate, we've got to have H. Plus. No H, plus, no reaction. So it's acid catalyzed. All right, I'm going to pick up on page 262. So I'm going to assume that you're okay with how we make carboxylic acids. But I'm also going to touch on. Um, a couple of things um, because a couple of silicic acids we'll come back to a little bit later. Now, the couple of silicic acid, depending on the length of the carbon chain, depending on the length of the carbon chain, the couple of silicic acid sometimes is called a fatty acid. Is that word? Who's doing biology? Doing biology a distinct advantage, all right? So you might see the word fatty acid, and we'll use it a little bit later. Fatty acid is a long chain, carboxylic, 
long chain calcosonic acid. Just keep that in the back of your mind. All right. So we don't generally call all calcosonic acids fatty acids. We've got to have a long carbon chain, like greater than ten. Yeah, greater than ten, I think. Well, well, I'll throw that out there. I think it is anyway. So, calcosonic acids general formula. R C O O H. Now you would see that carboxylic acids, up to what carbon chain length are they going to be soluble in water? Is ethan ethanoic acid soluble? Vinium? Yeah, is propanoic acid soluble? Yeah. Butanoic acid is soluble? Yeah. Pentanoic acid is soluble? Yeah. No. Okay. So what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to make here is as soon as we end up uh, with a long carbon chain and we are trying okay, to force this compound here to H bond and essentially be soluble in water, we run into problems okay, with long chain carboxylic acids. Short chain, no problem. We know they can H bond, they're happy to become water soluble. Now, if you look into your book, and if you look around about um, page 263, it talks about drugs, okay? And it has two drugs sitting side by side. It's got aspirin and ibuprofen, okay? The ibuprofen is, um, what about, what's the name for it now? No, what do they call it? Ibuprofen, they have another name for it, but this is the active drug, okay, in that. So, aspirin and Panadol and Ibuprofen, okay, or Ibuprofen, however you want to pronounce it, they are all painkillers, okay, and they act in slightly different ways. But all the painkillers, if you look at the structure, what do you notice about their structure? For example, let's look at aspirin. They've got a benzene ring, yet they're all aromatic. Here it is, we'll just do this one, which is a structure for aspirin. Aspirin. Okay, aspirin, yep, the common name is acetyl salicylic acid. It's got a benzene ring, and as Mason said, we categorise it as aromatic. Do you think that's going to be soluble in water? Just aspirin. Do you think it's going to be soluble in water? No. By the way, one thing I forgot to mention is, I said all these drugs are used in, in a, as a painkiller in one form or another. Okay, aspirin's also a blood thinner, because I take it occasionally. So, how does that get absorbed into the body? Normally through the stomach. You have to ingest it, okay. But, does anybody know in what form you normally take aspirin? Is it like that, is the question? No, it's not. Okay? So you don't normally take aspirin in that form because the drug is not very soluble. Okay? It's much easier to dissolve the drug first. And we've sort of done this before, but how do I make this large molecular compound, long carbon chain, how do I make that soluble? Because it's not going to be absorbed very well by the body in that format. Okay, or well, I'm not going to be able to swallow it very easily. Okay, so what do we do? Any ideas? We turn it into a into a. We want to make it. We want to turn it into an iron. Exactly. So if I am able to turn a carboxylic acid, if I can change its structure into a salt, as Jack said, then provided the salt is a soluble form of the salt, like sodium or potassium or ammonium, it becomes water soluble. Because I'm not talking about now, I'm not talking about H bonding with water, I have transferred the structure and I've turned it into a different sort of secondary bonding. So if I did do that, how does the, how does the secondary bonding change? What sort of bonding am I looking at over here and why is it insoluble? That's H bonding. We just said the molecule is too big. This dominates the structure. It's predominantly non-polar. 
So the longer the carbon chain, the more insoluble the compound becomes. This is huge, okay? Molecular weight equates also to non-polar characteristic. QOHs, not many sites where it can H bond with water. And you've got the one. So this is also insoluble in water. So all we do is we turn these carboxylates or carboxylic acids into salts. Acid plus a base gives salt plus water. So we turn it into a salt. Now, this one here, all we do is, okay, we can react on this sodium hydroxide and we end up with a new structure, which is soluble. Here it is, one, two, three, four, five, and it turns into, okay, sodium, okay, one, two, three, four, sodium pentanoate. So that's a soluble salt. So I've turned a long carbon chain carboxylic acid that's insoluble into a soluble salt. And how's it become soluble? Because over here, it can iron dicol bond with water. Okay, so the long carbon chain, it does this. So this is obviously going to be in a lattice structure. I won't draw the whole lattice, right? But that means that the H of the water can now iron dipole with that. It's a full negative charge. And the sodium, that's what it matters, but the sodium can also okay, iron dipole with the water molecule. So we can easily make the salt, or easily make the drug, that's insoluble into a soluble, therefore digestible form that gets in the bloodstream. That's where you need it for it to work. Tomati. So you reacted it with sodium hydrogen carbonate. Yes, yeah, same thing. Same thing. It would be, yeah. Oh. Okay. You can you can react with sodium hydroxide I've chosen, or you can use a carbonate or a sodium or a hydrogen carbonate. Okay. They're gonna all give you salts. Alright, so this one over here, here is my aspirin, so I can turn it into a soluble form of aspirin. Um, which is this one here. I'm just going to redraw that structure again. And that would be like this. So when I, when I take aspirin, I have to dissolve it into water first. Okay, it's actually a, so it's a sodium um, form of the salt, and it does, if the best, it's got some um, sodium carbonate bacilla in the tablet. It's soluble. You don't really see the aspirin, all right, but it's there. You swallow it, and then what happens is, when it hits the stomach, it does this, it goes back and it reacidifies. Okay? So it turns back into aspirin. And it's obviously it's easy to absorb once it's getting it gets into the into the stomach lining. Alright? All the all the small intestine. So that's what we tend to do. It's a big little it's a big big little, doesn't make sense. It's a big section on page two sixty three, drugs with carboxylic groups as part of their molecular structure. All right, any questions with that one? Anybody? Okay, so we've actually done, we just sort of touched on again, primary, secondary, tertiary, alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, calcic acids. And I'm gonna just stop there for today, Jack, and I'll pick up the A means, we'll come back to it, all right?